Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome all. Uh, welcome all of you. Um, so this is our first uh, online lecture. Eh? We try to do the best that we can. Uh, I will try to uh, explain uh, uh, the subject starting from where we left off uh, before the MCO. Okay. So now I'm going to share the um, the slides so that uh, you can go through uh, with me. Okay. Um, we will start from attributes of a modern engineer. So, apa ni? Uh, you can uh, uh, switch off the uh, the mic because it's uh, what we call it uh, interfering with the uh, with my lecture. So, okay. When you want to ask question, then you can uh, switch on your your mic and ask question. Okay, you can interrupt me anytime. Okay. Okay, sir. Everybody ready? Ready, sir. Okay. Uh, attributes of a modern engineer. Sir. Yes. Uh, what do you see? Uh, uh, when you become an engineer, what? What do you see yourself? How, how how an engineer should be? Professional. Hmm? Professional. Creator. The first creator. What else? So to be to to become a uh, to create certain things, uh, to create things, to create systems, so uh, to create solutions. Basically, that you need to be technically competent. Okay, so you need to have enough knowledge uh, and competent in it so that you can do something with it. Okay, uh, for to, to become an engineer, you must go through four years of uh, studies at the universities, okay, at the higher education institute. Okay, so that to give you uh, the knowledge, uh, the technical knowledge, so that you can be competent as an engineer. Okay, that's the first one. The second one is that you must be able to conceptualize. Uh, you should be able to visualize. Uh, uh, the solutions for the problem. Okay, so you you have to be able to conceptualize your ideas eh? so that you can implement in the real world. So you must have that ability. In order to conceptualize, of course, you need certain technical knowledge. Right. So. It actually relates to the first point, which is technically competent. Without that technical knowledge, you will not be able to conceptualize your ideas. Your idea will not be will not turn into a concept if you don't have that technical knowledge. Okay. The third one is that the uh, the ability to plan and modify when situations changes while maintaining the goal of the plan what it means is that as an engineer you must be able to plan what are you what you are going to do after you have conceptualized your ideas okay uh, for a certain problem a solution for a problem therefore you need you must be able to plan how to realize that concept so, what are the the elements of of planning? Basically, that you need to know the time, you need to know the budget, you need to know what is the resources that you have. So you should be able to have that to be able to plan with the resources that you have. So this actually covers under engineering management. 
eh, we are not cover in this uh, engineers uh, in society eh, in terms of planning and whatnot we cover in a, a different subject okay and of course even though you plan but throughout the course of carrying out the project the situation change your assumption maybe uh it's not uh it's not right therefore you need to change your assumption when you change your assumption therefore you need to modify your plan so the, the engineer should be able to do that modification while maintaining the same goal of that plan okay okay sir. so the so the engineer should be able to do that the fourth element is that the competent in design you are not only competent in conceptualizing the solutions but also must be able to design yeah? an engineer must be able to design assemble the facts yeah? uh, basically that looking at the uh, literature review looking at what are the solutions out there that people have done? Uh, what are the components that requires uh, in your design? Then you arrange them, uh, you analyze uh, and judge in the drawing uh, and, you, uh, and you draw the conclusions, basically that you make the conclusions based on your analysis, based on your design whether the design is good, whether design is bad, whether design requires modification, whether the, the design meets uh, the expected uh, uh, requirements. So basically that that is the attributes of a modern engineer. Competent, conceptualize, plan, modify while maintaining the goals. Uh, competent in design. Uh, the process of doing design, eh, the engineers must do. And this is actually, if you look at uh, in your four years of study, you go through all this from year one, year two, year three, year four. And it's actually uh, all bring together in your final year projects where you have to utilize all what you have learned for the past four years. Okay? Clear? Clear, sir. Any questions so far? No, sir. How are we going no. to apply this to the final year project? Thanks, man, sir. Final year project, basically that the planning, the methodology section, oh. the assemble the fact is basically your literature review. Okay? Analyze, basically analyze your results. Okay, sir. Yeah. So those are the elements that you use in your final year project. Yeah. Technically competent is basically that if if your final year project is in software, are you comp you need to be competent enough to write codes. If your uh, project is hardware project, therefore you need to be competent enough in hardware design. And this is actually what you go through through the final year project you 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 will be doing this in your real job in your in your real life the process of the uh, of what you go through in fyp basically those are the process that you go through in in real job of course at a bigger scale the fyp will give you that familiarity of going through the process so that when you go into a working environment when you do when you work you'll be able uh, to understand you'll be able uh, to uh, to carry out uh, your project successfully okay right? at least you have some experience already while doing your fyp okay other uh, attributes are engineers are cost conscious. 
that you should be able to make cost comparisons. Not all engineering products that you need to build yourself. Some, basically that, you buy. So you should be able to make the decision of buy or make. Whether you buy the solution or you make the solutions. This is actually covers in engineering management. I will not cover here, but that is also the attribute of modern engineer. Uh, they should be able to understand the costs uh, involved in developing the solutions. Okay, is it more effective or if it uh, more efficient to buy the solution instead of to build it yourself, for example, or is it cheaper to do it yourself? So most engineers basically that need to make that kind of decision throughout their career in their project. And this is actually um, a, a common trait of engineer. That, and of course, sometimes engineer, they like to everything they want to build themselves, for example. But is it... Uh, cost efficient is it effective maybe the money should be used somewhere else instead of uh, paying the engineers uh, the, the in-house engineers uh, building something which is not the um, what to call it the the core project products of the company or the core services of the company for example Maybe it's better to buy. Maybe the project is only one off. Okay. And of course, the engineers also must be able to communicate. Should be able to write, to speak, and to respond uh, to the queries uh, from people around you, from your bosses, from your subordinate, from your colleagues, from your customers from the public okay so the ability to communicate must be there whether it's in terms uh, in the form of writing in terms of speaking and in terms of sometimes it's even the body language of an engineer so you should learn this eh? the non-verbal communication skill also you need to learn or understand Right to write, basically the engineers must 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 be able to write reports. In your final year project, basically you write your thesis. You should be able to explain what you have done. Even when you work, basically you should be able to write proposals uh, to your superior or to your boss in order to get approval on what you want to do. So your, pro your proposal must be able to convince your boss. If your proposal are not able to, is not able to convince your boss, therefore, most of the time that your proposal will not be approved. So that skill is important. Okay? Second skill in communicating is to speak, to be able to present not just in writing, but verbally to present your ideas. And also must be able to respond to questions, uh, to queries uh, from people. When you present, basically that there must be question and answer. So you should be able to do that. And this is actually, uh, if you look at how we manage the FYP, we have panels uh, for you to present uh, your result, your FIP at the end of the semester. So this actually to give you the feel of how actually engineers are being, uh, the, the job of engineer when they try to communicate what they have done. Uh, 
you should be able uh, to have the skill to prepare the slides, uh, to prepare the uh, the presentations. Uh, you should be able to speak. And of course, the panel will ask you questions, so you should be able to answer those questions. Right? So those are the skills that is required to be an engineer. Also, another one is to develop management skills. You are not, you will not be an engineer for the rest of your life. Basically that you start with as junior engineer, then after that you be, become an engineer and senior engineer. And most of the time, most of the companies, after the senior engineer, you have to go to management. So basically that an engineer must be able to develop the management skill. After the senior engineer, they become assistant managers. So basically they go into the management already. Normally that, normally that the, um, you will do a technical part, huh? uh, maybe about 10 years huh? from junior engineer until to the senior, senior engineer level, about eight years, five years, something like that. Okay, then after that, you have to make a choice. If you want to progress in your career, most of the time that people, the engineers will go into management. They manage technical people. But of course, certain companies, they have dual ladder, which is uh, the management ladder and also the technical ladder. The technical ladder, from the uh, senior engineer, they will go into uh, principal engineer, uh, senior principal engineer, staff engineer, uh, senior staff engineer, then uh, principal staff engineer, and all those, uh, those levels. But not many companies have that kind of structure. Most of the companies, after senior engineer, you go into management. You start to become supervisors assistant manager of a technical department. Then you become the manager, uh, engineering manager, departmental manager. Then you become senior manager. Uh, then become assistant general manager. Then general manager and become COO and CO CEOs of the company. So looking at that scenario, therefore, whether you like it or not, you need to develop your management skills, especially in the human relations. Most engineers, they prefer to work with machines because machines will not talk back to you, right? Right, sir. So managing people is a bit more difficult because human uh, people will talk back to you. Huh? And they will show you that there are disagreements, for example. So how are you going to deal with this? So the engineers must be able to handle this human relation, must be able to develop this. So that's why uh, we also teach you the engineering management uh, about how to manage. Right? But in this uh, course, we are not going to cover that. Eh? We are more covering on the uh, ethics, uh, on laws, so that you aware eh, of those issues, especially the ethics, the engineering ethics, the professional ethics. Eh? Uh, engineers also must be able to make decision. Technical decision, decisions is quite easy because from the numbers, from your calculation, eh? you can make decision, right? Eh? It's very quantitative. Eh? It's based on numbers. But when it comes to the management, it's not necessarily a numbers that is important. Sometimes it's the qualitative part of it, the soft part of it, eh? the emotions, 
that's involved in making decisions. Right? Maybe the number says that, okay, we need to, uh, what do you call it, buy instead of make. But sometimes your boss says that, hey, we have to build this in-house. Maybe because he wants to justify the number of staff that he has in his department. So he needs to give jobs to the staff to do in his department. If he buy, maybe instead of he requires, instead of four engineers, he only need one purchasing engineer. So he will make decision that, okay, we need to build this in-house. So those are the kind of decisions sometimes that are being made, not because of the numbers, but because of the emotion, because of certain strategic issues. Another skill is that to lead. You should be able to lead a team. And especially if you are in military, then you have those chain of command. Eh? So that you should be able to lead your team. Eh? You have your platoon, your whatever. Eh? So those skills, you must be there, eh? must, must have. And of course, at the end of the day, you also need to be an advisor, technical advisor for your team, if you have a team. If you are a team member also, that you can become an advisor eh? to your team. Coordinator of a team. You coordinate. Eh? to make sure that your team runs smoothly. So those are the basic attributes of an engineer. Eh? It's not just technical. It's also a combination of technical competencies and human competencies and communication competencies. Okay? Basically, that after this uh, lectures, we will cover on some basic communication skills. I'm not sure whether I will cover today or maybe next uh, next lecture, eh? next meeting. Eh? We, we, we'll see. Designations. When are you, you can use IR, engineer, for example. So, because... Uh, those designations actually being governed through the Act of Parliament. Eh? We have laws governed there. There are certain designations which you cannot use. Okay. okay. This is actually uh, this uh, designation for engineers. In the early 1970s and before the BM came into being, uh, the corporate member and graduate member of IEM were entitled to use the designation engineer huh? or IR before their names. This is in early 1970s, before the law uh, being uh, drafted, being passed in the parliament. Okay? In 1989, the constitution of the institution of engineers had to be amended discontinuing the use of the state title as amendment to the Registration of Engineers Act 1974. Because Engineers Act 1974 only allows professional engineers to use the title IR. So IR is to the registered professional engineers only, not just any engineer. Right? So, so far, in 2005, uh, 2005, IE members then used the title ENGR uh, in front of their name uh, to indicate this an engineer, uh, in to, starting from 2005. And this actually has been banned by the Board of Engineers with effect from 2015. From 2015 onward, uh, engineers, which is not registered, 
uh, with board of engineers and one cannot use the title ENGR in front of their name. Right? So, they can only, uh, for IEM members, they can only put whether it's grad IEM or FIEM or FIEM at the back of their name. So, grad IEM is a graduate member of IEM. MIEM is a member of IEM. FIEM is fellow of IEM. So this they can use at the back of their name, but not the title ENGR in front of their name. Right? The IEM members who are professional engineer uh, registered with the Board of Engineers are free to continue, to continue using the abbreviation IR affixed to the front of their name if they wish. So they can use this. They can use their... Uh, the IR if they are registered with the Board of Engineers. Okay? Clear so far? Clear, yes, sir. Clear, yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is the route of becoming a professional engineer. We have three routes. Route 1, Route 2, and Route 3. For the details, I uh, uh, you can read from the slides. But what, what I can tell you is that the Route 1 is actually direct through the Board of Engineers. Basically, that you have obtained three years uh, practical experience after four years of the uh, bachelor degree. And out of that three years experience, two years, uh, at least two years of general training, which provide the sound basis of professional development and one year in professional career development and training provide a wide exposure to the various managerial technical expertise in engineering practice. So basically that two years in general training, which is technical, and one year some, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 managerial, and managerial and technical expertise. So basically that you manage projects uh, uh, and those kind of things. And at least one year of the, out of that three years training, uh, uh, under the supervision the professional engineer in the same branch uh, as the as the, that practiced by the graduate engineer. Basically that uh, this one year, at least one year must be obtained in Malaysia. Uh, all those three years must be under an IR. Mm. But two years can be Overseas, for example, eh? overseas projects. Eh? Then you have passed the professional assessment examination conducted by the board. And you have followed uh, the training, which is a code of ethics for 12 hours, health and safety at work, 12 hours, engineering management practice, 12 hours, and course related to your branch of engineering, about 24 hours. So you need to cover those. This is actually route one. This is through the Board of Engineers. Route two is through the IEM, where uh, first you register with the Board of Engineers as a graduate engineer. Then you register with the IEM as a graduate member. Then you start your practice uh, through the uh, logbook or mentoring under the IEM. After that, uh, basically that, you become the corporate member of IEM. So how to become a corporate member of IEM? Basically that, you have to comply to the requirement of the IEM or Board of Engineers is by obtaining three years of practical experience uh, as specified in the regulation 22.1, which has the following. Two years of the general training, just like we uh, through Board of Engineers. Uh, one year of professional and career development, just like in the through the Board of Engineers. Uh, at least one year training obtained in Malaysia under the supervision of professional engineers, just like in the Board of Engineers. 
and attended all those training, just like in Board of Engineers. But all this actually under mentoring by the corporate member of IEM. Basically that you go through uh, the test uh, to become a corporate member through the IEM. After you have passed the examination and become a corporate member of IEM, you can apply to the Board of Engineers to become, to be uh, approved as IR, Professional Engineer and registered under Board of Engineers. These are the route two. Route three is that actually this is from the uh, Chartered Engineer from overseas. Uh, so the application, let's say that uh, you have the uh, professional engineer certificate from UK, which is a chartered engineer. Then you come back to Malaysia and you want to practice. So therefore, you don't need to seek for professional assessment examination or to become a corporate member of IEM. You don't need to do that, but you need to submit to Board of Engineers the latest certificate from your from the country that you got your professional engineer certification. So then after that, you go through all those processes eh, through the road three. So these are the three routes how to become an engineer, a professional engineer. Any questions so far? No, no. sir. Yes. If kalau yang nak pergi study overseas kan, lepas, lepas grad, macam mm -hmm. kita bekerja dua, tiga tahun and then kita nak sambung belajar tu, mm. kita fokus kepada apa, sir? Biasanya? That Macam one is basically uh, not directly related to your professional engineering certification. Those can be doing your master's and whatnot. So, uh, the master's, uh, the uh, degree also can be used as part of the training to satisfy your requirement for professional engineer. Okay. okay? Yeah. okay sir. So this is actually the route, uh, the the route uh, to become a professional engineer uh, in graphical form. Basically, the first one is that the academic requirements, which is accredited engineering degree, normal route, uh, or you are already this uh, what we call it the foreign engineer, uh, which is you uh, you got the um, the the chartered engineer certification overseas. Uh? And also sometimes that your degree is not recognized by the Board of Engineers, for example. Uh, you got an engineering degree, but it's not recognized. Maybe from a certain country overseas. Uh? Then <laughs> this, these are the routes that, that, that you take. After the academic requirement, then you have the graduate registration. You register with the Board of Engineers. If you are accredited, you register with the Board of Engineers and also with the IEM uh, as a graduate member. Then you go through the requirement, the training requirement through the logbook scheme, which is under IEM or direct under Board of Engineers. Then you go for what we'll call it this uh, registration, uh, uh, professional registration. This is actually through the route of IEM. This is actually route two. Uh, route to uh, flowchart, not route one. Eh? So that's why they have professional in interview by the IEM, then becomes the IEM corporate member. Then after that, you become the professional engineer tier one under the uh, board of engineers. Then after a certain years, you take the professional competency examination, you become professional engineer with Practicing certificate, which is a tier two, uh, just like me. I'm a tier two professional engineer. I'm not a tier one professional engineer. Okay. The tier two is basically that is the highest level of professional engineer that you can have in Malaysia at the moment. Okay. Any question on this chart? So far, that's 
So these are actually the stamp, the professional engineer stamp by the the board of engineers. This is actually for the tier one professional engineer. Okay, the shape is actually is not round; it's a uh, hexagonal. Mm. Okay. One is the English version; the other one is the Malay Bahasa version. Okay. Okay, sir. And this is actually the tier two uh, professional engineer uh, stamp. So you have professional engineer with practicing certificates, uh, and the shape is round, right? And this is mine, nah, right? So I'm a tier two professional engineer, eh? and I have to renew every year. Renew to kena bayar ke sir? Of course, about four hundred four hundred ringgit uh, a year <laughs> for the professional engineer with practicing certificate. For the tier one is two hundred and fifty, if I'm not mistaken. Kenapa kena bayar sir? Basically, if you want to maintain your 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 qualification, you have to pay lah. Bukan ke qualification tu datang daripada kita punya experience and then kita pass exam semua tu. That all all ni all those you need to pay. Oh okay. Eh, it's not free. You need to pay. Okay, so. Because because. Uh, the cost of maintaining all those things is that that is 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 uh, a carry cost. Eh? Okay. okay. These are the uh, a few bodies which is related to engineering. Another, the first one is uh, besides the board of engineers, besides the IEM, and this actually and other bodies. Uh, for example. Suruhan Jaya Tenaga, uh, they also have certification for engineering. Normally, it's under competent engineers uh, in power industry. Eh, Suruhan Jaya Tenaga. So, they certify the competent engineer. This is an example of the certificate uh, given out for competent engineer in power engineering. Uh, So these are the levels of the competent engineer that uh, under the Suruhanjaya Tenaga JK0, which is up to 1 kV. JK1 is up to 11 kV. JK2 is up to 33 kV and so on until JK6, which is 500 kV. So if you are in power engineering, uh, in Tenaga National and whatnot, that you need to have this if you work with the transmission uh, power transmission uh, uh, high power line you need to have the competent engineer certificate right okay? i'm not going into detail on this i'm just showing you right so these are the steps and uh, the, the flow chart how to get those uh, what to call it uh, certification right okay? So it start with the 11 kV, yeah? then there is certain requirement that you can go into the 3 kV, 132, 275, and 500 kV. Yeah? So the other related uh, bodies, engineering bodies, for example, ASM, Association of Consulting Engineers, which is uh, the association uh, for uh, consultants, uh, engineering consultants. Eh? It's a non-profit uh, limited company. The objective is to promote the interest of all consulting engineers and consulting engineering as a profession. And they have the code of ethics also, a proper conduct of engineering business and all, all those kind of things. So uh, this one, I'm not going to go, go through the details. You can look at the slides. Eh? MSET, eh? Malaysia Society for engineering and technology. MSTAT is also a body which is actually the board of engineers actually outsource the, the, the training to become engineer under 
uh, to become professional engineer under MSET. Uh, so this is the vision of MSET to be the leader for national engineering as well as technical innovation and development. Uh, so it's international recognition, networking and opportunities. Uh, uh, so able to network uh, and interact with like-minded professionals. So they provide the networking with others. Uh, uh, with other engineers uh, uh, overseas also. Um, able to participate in CPD and lifelong learning programs. Basically that uh, in order for us professional engineers to maintain our certification, we need to complete uh, the continuous uh, professional development training. So every year we have to go to training. Like me, I have to go for 50 hours a year. So MSET actually provide this training for you to go, right? So that is the end of this engineering profession lecture. Any questions so far before we go into next topic? No, sir. Any questions? Tak ada. Tak ada, sir. Tak ada. So everybody okay? Okay. So We okay, have sir. 21, eh? we have 21. Eh? So I'm going into the next topic. Can I go into next topic? Sure, sure. sir. Chapter three, yes, sir. Next topic is on this. Um, carry on. Uh, this. Uh, Kejahan. Communication. Communication. Okay, effective communication. Normally, uh, in the normal uh, what call it in the face-to-face -face, uh, class, I would give a topic uh, for you to present uh, after this lecture, actually. But uh, with this uh, PKP or MCO, we we will not be able to do that. So I just go through the lecture and we, we see how it goes. Maybe after the MCO, when we have, when we be able to do face-to-face -face, uh, lecture, then maybe you can uh, do the presentation. So how many students that you have in class? 21, right? 21. Or maybe 21 students or 23 about that. So if 21... So one group, about three or four. Four, sir, four. Four. It depends, I think, on how much. So even actually after this, that I'm going to give the topic for your uh, Assignment. assignments and also your presentation. So we I, I owe you those two items. So now, for effective communication, The barriers to the communication. We start with the barrier of communication. What is the barrier of communication that you know of? Language. Language. What else? Confidence level. Confidence level. What else? Technical and management expectations, sir. Technical and management expectations. Exactly that. Uh, the technical jargons, right? The technical terms, right? That yes. becomes a barrier, right? Eh? Okay. These are the... There are, for example, the first one is the linguistic barrier. The barrier with which relates to the language. For example, lack of common language. It is a set of symbols having the having some meanings. Uh, for example, that in engineering we use certain symbols, right? E for energy, uh, V for the voltage, 
And sometimes that if you are not competent enough, even though it's technical, but it's still a linguistic barrier that some people that they don't understand what V stands for, what E stands for. So those are considered as like a common language. Huh? Even actually, in terms of the uh, terms that you use in English, it means something. In technical, it means something else. Uh, you can try to find all those uh, uh, examples later. Right? Another barrier, a linguistic barrier, is the grammatical error. Basically, it's a set of rules of languages. Uh, in terms of the grammar, for example, in terms of spelling also, the difference between L-O-O-S-E and L-O-S-E. Loose. Mm. Both sounds the same. But L-O-O-S-E, which is longer. L-O-S-E is hilang. So, but people mistake, make mistakes in terms of the grammatical error. Whether W-E-A-T-H-E-R versus W-H-E-T-H-E-R, whether. There's totally different meaning. Another linguistic barrier is the colloquialism, which is the phrases that you use. Uh, the colloquial meaning that you use. The informal words of phrases uh, that you use. Uh, for example, um, what? Oh, the, so, the, yeah. I uh, can see the slide. Huh? You cannot so, see the slide? Yeah, actually, everyone. Huh? You cannot see the slides? Uh, yeah. No, sir. Huh? I no, can sir. See the Nobody can see the slide. I can see, sir. I can see the slides. The slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Okay. You can see the slide now. Yes, sir. Okay. I started here actually. Start here. I start here. Okay. Okay. So I am here. Okay, sir. Okay. So informal words or phrases that you use, huh? colloquialism. And there are certain words which is used by the young generation. Uh, the WeChat generation, which I don't know. There are certain terms which I don't even understand. Right? So those are the linguistic barriers. Even actually the, the SMS or the WhatsApp uh, uh, short terms that they use. Uh, those are linguistic barriers. Uh, for example, LOL. For the old generation, they don't know what does it mean. So when you want to um, to communicate uh, with people, uh, you should be able uh, to gauge at what level they are so that you can use the language which is more suitable for them to understand. So that is actually uh, how you can um, reduce the linguistic barrier. Other linguistic barrier, basically, that the euphemism, using more polite words over harsh words. Yeah? For example, if you want to say, you are full of shit, yeah, maybe you can say that you are full of yourself.
Saya tak dengar suara ke? Saya so, suara mana suara? <laughs> tak dengar. Semute mic. Semute, kita termute. Saya so, suara suara. Semute so, mic tu. Okey. Hello sir. Tak, tak dengar setakat mana? Ada tak ada. Ha, setakat mana ah, yang tak okay, dengar okay. tadi? Tak tahu sir dah lama okay, dah. Okay, dah lama pasal okay. tak cakap. Kita rasa tak ada. Tak ada. Kita orang nak like ke? Ingat ha? kau. Sir, ha? dah habis sampai euphemism tadi, sir. Ha? Sampai ke mana? Sampai euphemism, sir. If we euphemism, okay. Ha. Okay, 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 carry on. Nampak lah? Ha, nampak, sir. Nampak, nampak. Okay. Euphemism. What do you understand about euphemism? More polite words. Basically that for example, when you want to, uh, you use more polite words over harsh words for example, if you want to say that you are full of shit, so you use, you are full of yourself. It carries the same meaning. Another barrier, language barrier, a linguistic barrier is the double meaning, words that has more than one meaning. Another one is jargon, which is, for example, the word status quo. Not many people understand what is the status quo is. Another one is regional mean, regional accent. For example, in Bahasa, in standard Bahasa, selalu means always. But in Kelantanese, selalu means now. So totally different meaning. Same word, different meaning because of the regional differences. So those are the kind of things that uh, relates to the linguistic barrier. So in order for you uh, to be able to present your ideas, uh, your proposal uh, clearly so that other people can understand, you should be aware of these barriers and you should tackle and try to, mini, to minimize this barrier or eliminate this barrier so that people can, under, can understand what you want to present. Okay. Another barrier is physical barrier, external noise. So that's why I ask you to switch off the mic so that the external noise will not interfere with my uh, voice uh, so that you'll be able to listen. Uh, clearly to what I've said. So that is the external noise, physical barrier. Another barrier is the distance. Uh, so with this uh, MCO, for example, we are not able to do the face-to-face -face lecture. So the distance becomes a problem. So how are we going to reduce that, minimize that barrier by using the online lecture, for example? Uh, by using the uh, the uh, voice uh, voice call voice conference for example instead of the um, having a face to face uh, uh, lecture face to face meeting another physical barrier is the technical problem we want to do for example that we want to um, this relates also for the distance, for example, that we try to have a face-to-face -face online meeting, but maybe because of the technical problem that certain uh, students are not, not able uh, to have that facility for, vi for, for video conference, therefore we have to resort sometimes to voice, only voice calls. Or we can res we only resort to um, what do you call it uh, text through WhatsApp, for example. And another example is that, for example, this lecture, what what we are what I'm doing now is called a synchronous communication, where everybody listens live to what I've been what I'm saying.
what I'm presenting. But some of you are not able to join today, for example. Therefore, uh, I, I am recording this presentation, this lecture, so that students who are not able to join the synchronous session will be able to use we'll be able to replay, uh, we'll be able to view and to listen to this lecture uh, asynchronously, basically that, secara uh, offline later. Because this lecture, I'm going to put into the YouTube. And I will give you the link so that you can replay uh, again for you to go through what I'm being, uh, what, what, what I'm presenting today. So that is called a uh, asynchronous. So that is to eliminate the technical problem that we have. So clear. Clear, yes, sir. So these yes, are the sir. so these are the other barriers, eh? which is the difference in exposure. Difference in exposure. For example, my experience compared to all of you are totally different, right? I've been, uh, I, I live for almost uh, 50, uh, for more than 54 years compared to you, what, 24, 23? So it's about half uh, in terms of the uh, number of years and also different exposure. Uh, I've worked in the industry, for example, and you are still a student. So sometimes what I want to present to you, you will not be able to visualize, right? So therefore, I have to use different method of presenting, maybe by show and tell, so that you be so that you understand what I'm trying to present. So that's different exposure. Sometimes that. The barrier is also the usage of wrong channel. Wrong channel of communication. For example, a certain subject maybe is better to be presented using a video, but uh, you are using a text. Therefore, the message that is better presenting uh, or, or com uh, communicate through the video is lost when you use text. Another barrier is a frequent interruptions. Sometimes when you present, there are certain presenters basically that allow question to be asked in the middle of the presentation. And some presenters, they will not allow any question to be asked until they have finished presenting, then the audience can ask the question at the end of the presentation. So why do they do that? Because they want to reduce the interruptions of the flow of the presentation. Like me, I prefer you ask question anytime that you like. It does not matter. Uh, whether there is an interruption because that is better for me to answer there and then instead of waiting at the end of the presentation. Or sometimes I will ask, okay, you ask uh, after my presentation or you ask later when I come to that topic. Uh, sometimes I will do that. Uh, sometimes your question is actually related to the next topic that I want to present. Therefore, I said, okay, wait for until I present. The answer is in that presentation. That is the kind of barrier that we have. Another barrier is the lack of feedback. Personally, I prefer people, uh, the audience, to ask questions so that I know whether they understand or not. So that's why I will always ask, okay, any problem? Are you clear? Any question? Because that is actually for, for me to get the feedback. If the students, if the audience basically just quiet, blank, 
uh, staring in, in, in space. That is actually the sign of uh, not interested, uh, the sign of not understanding. So, uh, actually the lack of feedback. And that is actually a barrier when you try to communicate. Okay. Another one is lack of involvement. Basically, lack of, of involvement also is an, a barrier in communication because people are reluctant uh, to be involved. People are reluctant to show the interest uh, to the topic. And therefore, you are not able to modify your message or your presentation uh, for people to have a better understanding. So those are the kind of barriers that you have. Okay. Clear? Clear, yes, sir. So how to overcome this barrier? Do early so, questions. Of course, the first one, control. This is the first C. Control the length of the sentence. So basically that it's wiser to use short sentences as they are simple and easy to understand. So use short sentences. So in your thesis also, if you use uh, a long sentences, wind, winded uh, sentences, one paragraph consists of one sentence of 10 lines, that is basically uh, not effective. The reader will get uh, loss in your sentence. So make sure that the sentence is short and simple and easy to understand. So that is actually the first C, control the length of the sentence. Second, clear. You think clearly. Clarity of minds gives clarity to ideas and in turn clarity to communication. So you think clearly what you want to say. You think clearly what you want to write. Make sure you understand what you want to say. Make sure you understand what you want to write. A communicator cannot expect the audience to grasp the meaning of what he or she wants to communicate if he is not clear what he is trying to convey. So you must be clear first of what you want to communicate. If you don't have that clarity, people definitely will not understand what you want to present. And when people or when, order, when the audience asks you a question, then you get lost because you yourself it's not clear of what you want to say. And basically, this actually one of the common mistakes that the students do in their FYP presentation. We know that uh, we as a panel, we know that you don't understand the topic or you don't fully grasp the topic of your FYP sometimes. Clear? So think clearly of what you want to say. Third, prefer simple words. It is very simple to make communication more complicated. Basically that this is actually what, uh, what people say that if you cannot make them understand, then confuse them. That is actually uh something which is uh not good to do right? but uh a lot of people actually practicing that eh? they make the complication so convoluted to hide their incompetencies so they use big words they use jargons for them to show that they they are somebody that is actually not the right way of communicating because people know that when you use big words, jargons and whatnot, people will shoot you. 
And when you don't able, and when you are not able to answer them, then they know that you are bluffing your way through. So that's why sometimes in the presentation of of of, of FYP, uh, I will try to ask question with just to check whether they really know or not. So I ask certain things about definition. So if you don't understand, uh, if you they able not able to give that definition of a certain words, so basically they just uh, the student just bluffing through uh, their presentation. Okay, so use simple words. We express the hope that you will deal with the matter expeditiously. For example, what does it mean? Expeditiously. Is it, it, it? It is better to say that we hope you deal with the matter promptly, or we hope you deal with the matter now. So it's clear. Instead of the you use the word of expeditiously. So that is an example, right? Those are an example that, that I give. Right? Clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Any problem? Okay, Someone okay. clear? Clear, yes, sir. Okay. Number four. You consider the audience. Make sure that you understand who your audience are. Make preparation early. You analyze the audience before preparing to address them. Will they understand the technical terms? If they don't understand, then you use a, a layman's term, layman's term or general term, not the technical terms. And what are their education levels? Are they uh, bachelor degree students? Are they master students? Are they uh experts in their field so this actually you should do the analysis of your audience uh, before you present to them for example if you are FY, fyp uh, students you want to present to the panel make sure that you understand who are those panels in your presentation and you should be a, you, you should try to understand what kind of question normally that they ask in the uh, presentation so those are the kind of uh, uh, what call it is uh, uh, homework uh, that you need to do. Basically, that to prepare to understand your audience, so that you can present in a way that they should be uh, that we they, they will be able to understand. Right? When you use jargons, use cautiously. Select words that the audience can understand. If the audience are all Malays, for example, then don't try to use jargons or idioms or pre bahasa from a different uh, culture, which they may not understand. For example, uh, the when you use okay. Uh, It's better to work with the devils that you know. There is a saying in English. It's better to work with a devil that you know. For, for Malays, that is actually very bad. We don't work with, devil, with devils. We don't deal with them at all. But that is the idioms that people of non-Malay speaking understands. So if you want to use that, so must be used cautiously so that people will not turn off from your presentation. Okay? Clear. Number five, use familiar words. It is advisable to use familiar words rather than unfamiliar foreign words. 
for example, antiquated machines. What does it mean by antiquated? Why not you use the old machines? Antiquated is antique, old, or outdated sometimes. So use familiar words. Don't use words which people don't understand. And I found this sometimes from your lab reports, uh, from your thesis, uh, that they use words which actually they don't even understand. You know why? They cut and paste from somewhere else. We lecturers, we know what is the level of our students, what kind of, of language that they should that, that, that they normally use. So when we found, when we find the words, which is, uh, we see that it's not their level, we know that this is actually taken from somewhere. So sometimes that is actually a signal that, okay, maybe there are some plagiarism involved here. If they don't uh, give citation or they, go, they don't quote from where they, that they got this, uh, what do you call it, phrases, for example. So be careful. We have a lot of experience in this. Okay? The seven C's of effective communication. So when you want to communicate, this is the seven C's of effective communication. Just now we talk about clarity, right? Uh, some of them. So these seven are clarity, completeness, conciseness, consideration, correctness, concreteness, and courtesy. These are the seven C's for effective business communication or even in technical communication. It does not necessarily business. This technical communication also is applicable. So that's why I, I take this, uh, this chart. Right? So clarity, completeness, conciseness, consideration, correctness, concreteness, and courtesy. So when we talk about effective communication, one thing that comes in mind that what we are, the basic principle of effective communication, this principle tells us how, you, how your message can become effective to your target group. So you have seven C's for effective communication. These are the sevens. Hmm? Completeness. Message receiver, either listener or reader, desire complete information to the question. So basically, for example, a question from a customer. They want a complete information about your product. If it's an engineer, your boss basically need a complete information from you as an engineer about your design, for example, about your solutions, right? And you need to provide uh, complete information in a very short span of time. For example, you have 20 minutes to present your FIP. So you only have 20 minutes to present a complete information about your FIP. Sometimes in the business, you only have five minutes for your presentation or to convince people who want to give you to fund your projects. If possible, provide some extra information which he or she does not know and which may be useful to him. So sometimes you need to give this information in appendix. Not all in your main text, but in some or in appendix, this additional information. In this way, you can maintain a good business relationship with him. Otherwise, he may switch to another company, for example. The message must be complete. It should convey all the facts required by the audience. The sender of the message must take into consideration the receiver and should communicate all the facts and figures related to the message. Dengar tak saya punya voice? Dengar voice. Okay. All right. Kalau tak dengar nanti, cakap lah. Just in case takut ter-switch off. Okay, sir. Okay. So, how to get this? This is actually 
you need to ask this question. Who, what, when, where, and why? The five question method is used when you write a request, announcement, or other information messages. For instance, to order or request a merchandise, make clear that what you want, when you need it, and where it is to be sent. So you should practice this. Huh? So ask, who is it for? What are you talking about? Or what, what they are looking at? When they need it? Where to get it? And why do they need this? So my question actually normally will cover a basic information. Another C is conci conciseness. Concise means convey the message by using fewest words. Uh, the short, uh, keep it, keep it sweet, and uh, uh, keep it short and simple. Concise is the prerequisite of effective communication. As you know that all of us are short of time. Hence, a concise message saves the time for both the receiver and the giver. So it must be concise, not a long-winded kind of sentences. It's communicating what you convey in less possible words. Concise is a necessity for effective communication. Huh? Concise communication has this for it both time saving as well as cost saving. Underlines the and highlight the main message. Concise communication provides short and essential message in limited words to the audience. Concise message is more appealing and comprehensible to the audience. So in your FYP presentation, sometimes that you know part the you will see the panel uh, agitated. Sometimes, gelisah, uh, because you are not being concise. Sometimes it's a long-winded presentation. Uh, so you should be able to see the audience, their behavior and whatnot, and make it concise. So how to avoid, how to ach achieve conciseness? First, avoid wordy expressions. For example, you use now instead of at this time. Include only relevant material. Stick to the purpose of your presentation. And avoid unnecessary repetition. Third, consideration. Consideration means to consider the receiver's interest or intention. What is important for the people that you are talking to. So you consider their interests when you are doing presentation, where you want to convey certain messages. Of course, you have your interests, but if your interest is not coincide with his interest, he will not be listening to you. So what you need to do is that you make your interest to be his interest. So it's important in effective communication while writing a message, you should always keep in mind your target group. You should be, you must try to make it your interest to be his interest. Then he will be interested in your proposal. He will be interested in listening to what you have to say. Consideration implies stepping into the shoes of others. Effective communication must take the audience into consideration. The audience viewpoint, background, mindset, educational level, and whatnot. So this actually, you need to do a pre-homework to understand, to understand your audience. Make an attempt to envisage your audience, their requirement, emotions, as well as problems. Ensure that the self-respect of the audience is maintained and their own emotions are not at harm. So sometimes when you do, when you make jokes in your presentation, make sure that you understand your jokes is not sensitive to, it's not insulting to them. So those are the kind of things that you need to do with regard, with regard to consideration.
How do you do that? Focus on state of you or instead of I or we. You always say that you. Huh? When you present something I, then people get turned off. Oh, that is your interest, not mine. We is acceptable. To me, we is acceptable because uh, you put yourself in as to be part of them. So for me, uh, you and we are. Uh, uh, I would prefer we actually instead of instead instead of you, because you, it sounds like uh, you are uh, above them. You are not part of them. Then you are separated, so you are not connected. So it's like you have a two teams: I team and you team. So I would prefer we. But sometimes in in uh, uh, in, in certain uh, 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 situation, you is more appropriate. So you and we uh, uh, is accept, uh, more acceptable. Eh? Show audience benefit or interest of the receiver. Emphasize the positive, pleasant facts to them. Number four, concreteness. Actually, after these seven these slides, I'm, uh, after these seven Cs, I think we can stop for today. Lah, eh? The almost uh, 12. Eh? So I'm not going to push to until one. So it'll be too long. Eh? Okay? Okay, Hello? sir. Uh, yeah. oh, okay, sir. Semua dah tidur lah. Tak ada doktor. Ah, orang ramai tidur biasa kalau face to face. Ha. Tak ada. Kak kelas setuju ke? Check on. Kak kelas setuju. Dekat dekat apa ni? dekat rumah ni ada minum kopi apa semua tadi? Ada. Boleh kopi ada kopi. Memang fokus memang fokus. Okey. Number 4. Correctness. Correctness, it means that the message should be specific instead of general. Misunderstanding of words created creates problems for both parties. So, uh, this, uh, no, I mean concreteness, because we're not concrete, uh, correctness. Uh. I'm not wearing my glasses, so uh, excuse me for that. Uh. It's concreteness. So, the message must be specific, not in general. So, jangan just merapu in general. It must be specific to the subject misunderstanding of words create problem for both parties when you talk to your client or your audience always use facts and figures instead of generic or irrelevant information so sama juga lah in uh, final year presentation we know that you are bluffing when you cannot give figures for example in result we said okay what is your, uh, for example, say, uh, what is your uh, level of accuracy? Let's say the, the panel asks about your, your FIP. What is the level of your, exp your, 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 your accuracy? So you talk about, okay, well, uh, from uh, my, uh, my collection is about uh, 80%. Then you know that. Even though you give a figure, but you are not sure. It's not concrete. But if you said, okay, uh, from my mean square error uh, calculation, this, 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 this. Then you know, okay, based on mean square error, this is the level of accuracy. Now we know exactly because you mentioned about how you measure it instead of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is the concreteness. Concreteness, concrete communication implies being particular and clear rather than fuzzy and general. Concreteness strengthens the confidence. Concrete message has the following is features. It, it's supported with specific facts and figures. It makes use of words that are clear and that builds the reputation. 
the concrete messages are not misinterpreted. It's rarely being misinterpreted because there is no leeway for people to mis misinterpret what you say. The following guidelines should help you to achieve concreteness. Use specific fixed and direct figures. Choose image building words. Example, this is an example if it's general. He is very intelligent student of class and stood first in class. But concrete, who is the student? Ram. What is the score? 85% in his graduation and he stood first in his college. So nampak, you see the difference between the general one. He is very intelligent. Who is he? Who is he? There is no name. And how intelligent is he? You give a score 85% and he stood first in his college. So that's the difference between something which is concrete and something which is not. Number five is clarity. In effective communication, the message should be very much clear so that reader or listener can understand easily. You should always choose precise words, always choose familiar and easy words and construct effective sentences and paragraph. Make it clear in your thesis, each sentences, each paragraph must be clear so that the reader uh, understands what you are trying to say, what, uh, what, what, what you did uh, in your research. The same thing in engineering. So these are the kind of things that we try to teach you. Uh, this slide is happening. Uh, the somebody present kata, in your FYP. Do, ada, tak ada. This is your first time uh, looking at these slides. Yes, sir. Because this is my slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Clarity implies emphasis on a specific message or goal at a time rather than trying to achieve too much at once. Clarity. In communication, yes, it makes understanding easier, complete clarity of thoughts and ideas enhance the meaning of the message. Clear message makes use of exact, appropriate, and concrete words. Six, courtesy. In knowing your audience, allow you to use statements of courtesy. Be aware of your message receivers. So if you make jokes, make sure that the joke is not uh, what do you call it, insulting to them. So be polite. Huh? It is politeness that grows our respect and concerns for others. Applying socially acceptable manners is a form of courtesy. For example, namaste. If your group is actually has, uh, what do you call it, uh, Indians origins, for example. You try, if, if you look at a uh, presentation by the uh, international presenters, sometimes that they try to use uh, words which is familiar to the audience. For example, a singer uh, from US uh, comes to Malaysia and they say, uh, what do you call it? Apa kabar Malaysia? And then basically all the, the audience uh, very, what do you call it, happy because uh, the singer trying to uh, use the Malay words, Malay greetings. It's the same thing. You as presenter, uh, when you go to, to present overseas and whatnot, that you try to build the, what do you call it, the relationship with your audience by being courtesy, by trying your best uh, to use certain words. In their languages, in their language. Okay? So that is courtesy. It's a message implies that should show the sender's expression as well, should respect the receiver. The sender of, should, of the message should be sincerely polite, judicious, reflective, and enthusiastic. What are the features of a courtesy message? It's courtesy implies taking into consideration both viewpoints as well as feelings of the receivers of the message. Courteous message is positive and focused at the audience, and it makes use of terms showing respect for the 
principles and it is not bias. It should be neutral. How to generate a courteous tone? The following are suggestions for generating a courteous tone. Be sincerely tactful, thoughtful and appreciative. Use expression that show respect for others and choose non-discriminatory expression. So basically mm -hmm. that uh, you have to be you have, sincere. It has to come from your heart. When you have passion for a certain thing, that it shows in the tone of your voice. So that tone of your voice actually comes from your sincere heart. Huh? So that is the easiest way to understand what courtesy is, how to be courteous. It has to come from your heart. And finally, is the correctness. Your presentation, your message must be correct. Not only in terms of content, but also in terms of proper grammar, punctuation, and spelling. So for your FIT, for example, you need to get people to recheck your grammar. For me, if I read a thesis which fools of, of mistakes, Maybe most probably that I read only one uh, one page per chapter. Then after that, I just put a, a, a red cross throughout the page. So it turns me off when there are spelling error, punctuation error, grammatical error, this kind of thing. Uh, it actually a barrier from people to understand what you are trying to present. So the terms correctness as applied to effective communication also means three characteristics. Use the right level of language. At what level? Easy to understand or difficult to understand? Too technical? Check the accuracy of figures, facts and words. So your results huh, of your experiments, those figures must be correct. The facts must be correct and maintain acceptable writing mechanics. <coughs> Correctness in communication implies that there are no grammatical errors in communication. Correct communication has the following features. Message is exact, correct, and well timed. If the commission is correct, it boosts up the confidence level. Correct message has greater impact on the audience. It checks for the precise, for the precision and accurateness of facts and figures used in the message. It makes use of the appropriate and correct language in the message. So, use the right level of language. There are three levels of language. Formal, informal, and substantive. Formal, sometimes it's called sir. Informal, hey dude, how are you? Substantive is basically is the <coughs> ghetto style of language. Language. <coughs> substandard language. Avoid substandard language. Using correct words, incorrect grammar, faulty pronunciation, or suggest as inability to use good and good English. Some example: ain't. It's more acceptable if you use isn't or aren't. Can't hardly. So basically, what is a can hardly? Aim to improving. It's an aim to improve. Desirous is the desirous to is the desirous of. And sometimes it's people write as stole instead of stolen. So those are an example of substandard language. Thank you. Any questions so far? Tak dapat sir. Tak dapat. So exam, so, what to find out to be, uh, online exam ke atau kita dah balik dah IPN ni? Dah balik kot, tengok macam mana. Okay. So, any question tu, on the lecture like today? Exam susah. Ha? Exam, exam susah. Biasalah. <laughs> so, dah lah kita orang tak belajar dekat kelas. So, Tengok lah macam mana. Ha? Tu buat soalan eh? Soalan? Soalan. Dan saya akan buatlah soalan separuh. 
So okay. Any question? Tak ada sir. Tak ada sir. Tak ada. So how long is 2 hours ah? Lah panjang juga ah. Kalau tak ada soalan then we can uh, what call it uh, uh, stop here and we meet uh, next week. Huh? What uh, what I'll do is that I'll try to um, upload the uh, assignments, the questions uh, by this week lah. Even though I promised last week, right? Yes. So. Sir. And what you need to do is that you need to uh, organize yourself into a group of three or four, and you give me your names, uh, your 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 grouping, and also the topic that you choose. Uh, so hopefully that there is no one group, uh, there is no two groups doing the same topic lah. I will try, but uh, uh, at least all the group, uh, all the topics are being uh, will be covered by uh, at least one group okay sir kalau nak buat so, uh, seorang boleh assignment boleh so basically that uh, uh, what i will do is that i will do the uh, i will give the the topic and you have until before uh, for the assignment is at before end of the uh, before the final week Huh? Before the exam, lah. And uh, for the presentation, uh, you need to prepare. And when we be able to uh, to meet face to face, then you can present the the you can do the presentation. Okay. Any Please other sir. question? Any other question? So, maknanya kalau saya nak buat dalam individually lah, saya tak nak ada dalam group saya nak buat individually boleh? Tak boleh. Because uh, one of the requirements uh, that, that is really you should be able to work in a group. Okay, sir. Okay? Because uh, we want to, uh, for you to to be able to work in a group. And actually, during this time, actually, uh you have a uh, a unique experience where you work in a team which is you cannot be at the same location so this is actually like um uh remote uh, uh, remote project team eh uh, it's remote project team so this is actually a unique experience that you will be able to get which nobody uh, has experienced before taking this course by working remotely with your project team so you have three or four uh, working together remotely that is actually uh, takes uh, uh, certain skills so that skill is basically that you learn uh, through collaboration Uh, remotely, which actually yes, I have worked uh, in in remote teams uh, since 1998 with uh, a few companies uh, uh, with a, a team in 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 Noida, India, Delhi. So I'm in KL, and uh, some of the team members is in in uh, in Delhi. So we work remotely. So. This is actually a good experience for you, how to work as a team, remotely. Okay. Any question? Yes, If it, kalau tak ada, then we stop here. Yes, so we we'll see next week. Thank you. Yes, yes, After, yes, this, yes, then, yes, After this, I will put the video on the YouTube. Thank okay. You. Thank you. All right. Okay.